You're listening to Leading Up with Udemy. This podcast is your guide to developing your skills as an emerging or seasoned leader. I'm Alan Todd, your host and the Vice President of Leadership Development at Udemy. Together, we can work, lead, and live differently to create a better world. I was excited to have Mark Edwards on the podcast today. I loved how Mark, he talked about two kinds of people, the away from people and the towards people, and that when you're telling stories, you have to have an exciting vision for the towards people, and you have to have a safe vision for the away from people. When you only have that towards language, it's exciting, it's innovative, it's new, it's dynamic. No one's ever done it before. It's revolutionary. Towards people are lapping that up. Away from people are thinking, I'm not going to go anywhere near this idea. Every positive moment that you're landing, every positive idea you're landing with a towards person, you're landing a negative with an away from person. You need to give both of those types of people a sense that we've ended up in a good place. This week, I'm speaking with Mark Edwards, author of the new book, Best Story Wins. Mark is a mindfulness coach and one-time music journalist. He's written for London's Sunday Times nearly every week for the past 25 years about music and wider cultural issues. His books include Belonging, as well as The Tao of Bowie. With his new book, Best Story Wins, he's written an incredible handbook about how to use storytelling to improve communication in the workplace and in life. Mark, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Beautiful. So, Mark, you've had a fascinating career as a chief music critic for the Sunday Times. You wrote a book about David Bowie's philosophy of life. So before we get into storytelling, I'd love to hear, how did you come to that idea? Well, that's the book that brings everything together. The thing about David Bowie is, as well as being a global superstar, he was also someone who struggled with mental health issues his whole life. The phrase he used about his family was that they were cursed with madness. Of course, we wouldn't say that today. Right. That was how his family spoke to him about his family. That's what he grew up with, believing he was, quote, cursed, unquote. And David Bowie thought, this is going to happen to me, but I am not going for conventional psychiatric treatment because I've seen what happens to people who do. So he created his own kind of self-help mental health and well-being philosophy out of everything that he learned from Buddhism. That was his starting point. He studied Jungian psychology. He studied the philosophy of Nietzsche, and he put the whole thing, all of this together into a philosophy that helped guide him through life. So the book is about saying, here's what David Bowie did. Here's where he learned it from. Now you learn these things too and apply these lessons to your life. And along the way, if you are a David Bowie fan, the book will also help you understand a lot of those lyrics to those songs that sounded so cryptic and weird before. You'll suddenly realize, oh, he's singing about Buddhism or, oh, he's singing about Nietzsche or or whatever. And it all starts to make sense. That's fascinating. Mark, you said this is the book that brings it all together. What did you mean by that? Well, I think I've had this strange career. You can call it a squiggly career or a zigzag career. And the Bowie book sort of brought the whole thing together. Anyone that I did any work with, I could give them that book and go, that tells you something about me. And hopefully, even better, it will tell you something about you. Okay. So I want to move to storytelling. How did you get to storytelling? How'd that pop into your consciousness? Well, when I was starting out as a a journalist in the advertising trade press, and I was writing about advertising agencies and especially media agencies, you know, the the agencies that do the buying and selling of the airtime and actually place the ads in the right place. When I started out, the creative agencies dominated and the media agencies were quite looked down upon. But the whole world was about to change. And now the media agencies are the dominant force because the world of media has exploded over the last 25 years. And as that was starting to happen, media agencies started to have to pitch for business uh, in a way they hadn't done before. To begin with, they were just price, we'll do it cheaper, end of story. You know, suddenly they had to have a more 
complicated and nuanced story. So when I stopped being a journalist writing about advertising, I started being approached by media agencies and advertising agencies saying, will you help us to write pitches? And that's where the storytelling really, really came from. Understanding that you could have three or four agencies pitching for the same account. And honestly, they are going to be very, very, very similar. They'll have the same tools. They'll have the same kind of talented people. They will have similar strategies. What is going to differentiate and what is going to differentiate is going to be the story and the emotional connection that you make with the client, with the story. Which you argue quite persuasively for in the first chapter or two. Yeah. Do you know Rory Sutherland wrote the book Alchemy? I know who Rory Sutherland is, and we have been at similar events and, and nodded and waved and said hi, but I, I am not a close personal friend of Rory Sutherland, no. Well, but I absolutely know who he is, yes. So he wrote a fabulous book called Alchemy, and, and we had him on the podcast, and he says that the problem with logic is that it kills off magic is one of his th mantras. And another one is solving problems using only rationality is like playing golf with one club. Your whole first chapter is on this. Can you, why is using logic and reason, which is conventional wisdom, that's what we've been told as everything. Why is using that alone a limiting view for us? First of all, a little sidebar here, that takes us straight back to the Tao of Bowie and Buddhism and mindfulness and meditation. What you're going to learn there is that logic is limiting you and you have to move beyond logic. What do we learn in storytelling? Logic is limiting you and you have to move beyond logic. The typical way in which somebody in business would write a presentation or a pitch or a big document would be to start with a, what do we want to say? And what's our logical argument? And it's such a default thing that we almost don't even think it. It's just, that's what people do. They build a logical argument. And that's not a bad thing to do, but it's not enough. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And the reason it's not sufficient is because we all make decisions for emotional reasons. And then once your decision has been made, a part of your brain, which neuroscientists refer to as the interpreter, comes along and looks for logical reasons to justify it. It's like your brain says, why did I make that decision? There must have been a reason. And then it comes up with the logical reasons afterwards. So it's a good idea to have the logical reasons because that part of the brain is going to go looking for them, but that will not be why somebody makes the decision. They make the decision for an emotional reason. The other problem with a logical argument, of course, is that it builds resistance. And I think we all know this from our own experience. If somebody starts giving you lots of reasons why you should do something, you start to come up with reasons why you shouldn't, because you're like being forced into a corner here. This person is trying to like make me do this thing. Uh, there must be a reason why I don't want to do it as well. And so you want to bypass that by focusing on the emotional connection that storytelling has. And storytelling has a very deep emotional connection for most of us. And I mustn't generalize too much here. Not everybody has a happy childhood, of course, but, but for most of us, initial contact with stories is a very warm, positive emotional experience. So you're, you're tapping into something quite deep once you start using storytelling. You wrote in the book, without emotions, we cannot make decisions. And you said something along the lines of, let me be clear, keeping emotions out of it is not only a bad idea, it's impossible. Yeah. I thought that was pretty powerful. Because you get told that by people, can we just keep emotions out of this, please? Well, you just can't do that. Yeah. No one can do that. Right. We can feel that we've kind of buttoned down and making logical decisions, but we are fooling ourselves. That's not what's actually happening inside us. What's happening inside us is an emotional reaction. And it's much, much better to understand that and know that both when you are the person telling the story, but also when you're hearing the stories to understand what it's doing to you and realize that emotions are involved. I mean, literally in terms of the neuroscience, if you could literally take all the emotions out of a person, they would not be able to make decisions. They would literally not be able to make a decision. The decision-making is emotional. Yeah. So Brene Brown is a leadership author, best-selling author and professor, and she has a quote, stories are data with a soul. Yeah. And you provide research in the book about how our brains experience stories versus numbers and logic. I thought that was interesting as well. I want to talk about telling stories with data. 
because uh, you know, they're not two separate things. And data usually tells a very powerful story if you let it. But giving people just lots and lots of facts and figures, just the data is the antithesis of storytelling. The thing is to find the, the, the story in the data. And data normally has a story in it. Why do we look at data? We look at data because we're looking for change. We're looking for something that stands out. We're looking for either proof of something that we thought was there, or we're looking for exceptions to what we thought was there, or we're looking for new trends. We're looking for a moment of change or transition. And in the moments of change or transition, there is a story. Why did this happen? What was different? What's changed? And so the data itself will be mind-numbingly boring for most people. But if you can find the story in the data, the significance of the data, then then you've got something that can you know you can use to really communicate with people. So let's go through what makes a good story, and then I'd love to come away with a lesson or two that we can teach sure. our listeners that they can get better at this. But let's start with the basics. What's a good story? Story is very very hard to define in a sentence. So what we can do though is we can say, what does a good story have? And this goes back to Aristotle because so many things do. The first thing a good story needs to have is unity of action. It's got to be about one thing. And this is where so much business communication falls down is you've got a group of stakeholders trying to create this piece of communication and they all want to add stuff to it. A good story is about one thing only. And a good story, if we go step back from business for, for a moment and think about storytelling in the wider sense, the thing that a good story is about is a hero who wants to get something and everything that stops them getting that thing and everything that ultimately helps them to get that thing. That's the story. That's the hero's journey. What else do we know about story? Well, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, which is both very profound and also sounds a bit too simple to be true. I mean, you know, a three-course meal has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But a story does need to begin somewhere for a reason, not just start randomly. Its middle needs to have a causal chain. Everything happens has to happen because of something else. And there has to be an end point. There has to be a quest which is clear at the beginning and which you finally reach. I think the two other things that stories, good stories have to have is that under pressure, we learn something. So if we think about movies and Star Wars, you know, Luke is going to learn to use the force. And in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is going to learn that she doesn't need anyone's help to get home. She can do it herself. And however many stories you look at, you come back to this theme. You see how close those two are? It's about discovering agency. The hero discovers their agency. They discover that they can do something they didn't know they could do. Okay. The final thing that a good story has to have, and this is my, I think, my favorite thing to teach because people don't know about it and it seems so unimportant and it's actually incredibly important, is a story has to, as they say, save the cat. And save the cat is a phrase from a screenwriting teacher called Blake Morrison. And it's this. If you're going to make a movie about someone who is not very nice, maybe they're a brutal assassin, they kill people for money. In the opening scenes, you'd better show them rescuing a kitten from a tree so the audience can go, you know what? This is actually a very nice person and I like them. And whatever else they do in the rest of this film, I care about this person because they saved that kitten. And you'll see this in all the novels and movies that you love. There is a moment when the hero saves a cat. And obviously it doesn't have to be a cat. The first 20 minutes of Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is saving her dog Toto from the bad woman. You know? Now, if you cut that 20 minutes out and get straight to, as it were, the action, you haven't got the same film because who is this little girl and why do we care? And I do give an example in the book, which I find fascinating about the uh, the movie Trains, Planes and Automobiles with Steve Martin and John Candy, which is an absolute comedy classic. And But when they made the film, it was quite long. So they showed it as is routine to preview audiences. 
And the preview audiences didn't just give it bad marks, they walked out. So they recut the movie and they showed it again and the audience walked out again and they recut the movie and they showed it again and the audience walked out again. It was a disaster until they finally found what was going wrong. They had taken out a scene, it was about 13 seconds long, and Steve Martin is going to buy a train ticket for John Candy's character because John Candy doesn't have any money. And in the scene they cut out, John Candy said, give me your address so that I can pay you back. And Steve Martin, who at this point wants nothing further to do with John Candy's character, says no. He doesn't want to give him his address, so he says no, it's fine. Now that doesn't further the story at all. So if you're trying to cut down an overlong film, of course you take it out. But once they took that out, people hated the film. When they put that in and people saw, oh, John Candy isn't just a freeloader. He wants to pay his way. I like John Candy now. And now people are laughing at all the jokes and it's hilarious and they love the movie and it's a success. Now that moment of alignment between the audience and the character on screen is absolutely vital to storytelling. And most people who will talk to you about story don't talk about it because it sounds almost too soppy. You mean you've got to like them? Yeah, you've got to like them. That's it. You've got to like them. Otherwise, you switch off or you walk out of the, the movie. So we need to transfer that to our business communication. And we don't have to be quite as clever. We don't have to align the audience with a fictional character, but we have to align the audience with us. Basically, as silly as it sounds, they have to like us. We have to do something to make sure that they think we're the kind of person they like and that they agree with and that they want to listen to. So, Mark, can you give me an example of someone who does that well, creates that alignment, that connection with the audience? Yes, I think a, a fantastic example is in the TED Talk by Sir Ken Robinson called Are Schools Killing Creativity? Or it might be called Do Schools Kill Creativity? For many, many years, it was the most watched TED Talk of all time. I don't know if it still is, but it, for many, many years it was. And the reason is because everyone who watches it gets hooked and everyone who watches it then recommends it and recommends it and recommends it. And you get hooked right at the beginning when Sir Ken Robinson comes on the stage. And it is the exact opposite of most of the TED Talks that you've seen. He walks on stage and it is immediately as if he's not giving a talk. He's just a member of the audience who's having a conversation with other members of the audience. It's a completely different dynamic than almost any other TED Talk you've ever seen. He aligns so well, he becomes the audience. He starts out and he says, it's been great, hasn't it? He's not talking about his talk. He's talking about the rest of the day. It's been great, hasn't it? And you might go, hmm, do you really say hasn't it to a huge audience? They're not going to reply, are they? But they do reply. You hear them all going, yeah. And he goes, there have been three themes, haven't there, during the day? And I'm watching this video and I wasn't there and I don't know, but I'm already nodding going, yeah, there have been three themes because if you say it's like, it's like, yeah, because it's, he's just, he's just chatting to me. Like we're just, we're just talking me and this huge audience and he's aligned immediately with the audience. And then he begins. And that's the absolutely crucial stage of storytelling. And that's why in the book, I create a six step storytelling process, a very simple formula that anyone can follow. And the first step is shared experiences because you need to create this sense of alignment, the sense of you and me, we're just talking, we're similar kind of people, we agree with each other about things, we get along, and then people will listen to the story. And I suppose, Mark, that works for sales pitches, that works for team meetings, it works for anything, creating that shared experience. 
I think, I mean, it does work for almost anything. I mean, in the book, we go through how to do it in a pitch, how to do it in a presentation, how to use it in a document, how to use it in a thought leadership article, how to use it in an email. But then also we look at how you can use it to structure a meeting. It's a fantastic structure for giving somebody feedback. And it's also a fantastic structure for a brainstorming meeting where you're trying to come up with ideas. So the, the structure is very simple. The acronym, because of course there's an acronym, is superb. So you've got S, shared experiences, U, ultimate triumph, P, problem definition, E, explore the options and the objections, R is real for make it real, and B is best of both worlds. And you can use this structure in just about any business situation to make the communication better and the outcomes better. So we talked about shared experiences. That's where you're going to start. The next stage is the ultimate triumph, which is, OK, we talked about the hero and the quest. What is the quest? We make the ultimate triumph clear right at the beginning. If everything goes according to plan, where are we going to get to? And we'd say that right up front. And this is because business communication is not about transmission of ideas. It's about the transmission of value and benefits. What's in it for me? The audience wants to know. So you tell them, here's the quest that you're on, and I am going to help you on this quest. That's kind of where the storytelling comes. And I've maybe skipped a very important part here, which is that your story is never your story. Your story is always the audience's story. You are a character in the audience's story. That's the way to tell the best story you can possibly tell. And of course, you probably might want to say, hang on, sometimes surely you have to tell your own story. Yes, you do. But you tell your own story in terms of the value or benefits that you add to your audience. So once again, you're thinking, what's their quest? What's their ultimate triumph? And I will talk about myself in terms of what I do that will help them to get there. That's what the question always is in business. It just comes in that, oh, tell us about yourself. The real question is always, what could you do to make my life better? So what I like so far, your uh, using your your sixth step, which spells the word superb, shared experiences, we're connecting with them. The most important first thing, get to a point where we all agree. The ultimate triumph is some vision of a better future that is capable. And then the next two is really the problem and exploring solutions, exploring options and objections. Can you talk about how those two things fit together and setting this thing of problem solution, problem solution? So I think the problem definition is crucial because we have to prove to the audience that we understand what's going on here and we understand their business and our business and we know, and again, it's a further level of shared experience. We all agree that this is the problem, right? We all agree that this is the challenge. And then what's critical to a uh, story is those ups and downs, a story in which there's a quest and the quest is achieved is a very, very boring story. There have to be challenges and then the challenges have to be overcome. That's the structure of a story. And it's too easy in businesses, especially again, when there are multiple stakeholders all trying to look good and important and justify the existence of their department. Everyone is trying to say, there's no problem. There's no challenge. There's no problem. We're fine. You haven't got a story if there isn't a problem and there isn't a challenge. So you do have to have a problem. There has to be a point at which something is difficult. And then you need to, okay, well, of course you want to solve the problem, but what you don't want to do is immediately solve the problem. To just go, there's the problem, here's our solution, isn't storytelling, it's kind of a hard sell. It's like, oh, your solution just happens to be the right solution, does it? How convenient, you want us to come and buy your product. So instead, we need to explore the different possible solutions and compare and contrast and work out which one might work. And we have to also explore what objections the audience might have about our solution. And this is the equivalent, if we're looking at a, back to the world of movies or books, it's the equivalent of all those kind of false starts the hero has, where uh, they try to fix the problem, but it goes horribly wrong, and they have to regroup and start again. You need a bit of that in there as well. You can't just jump to the solution. Yeah, I like that. So you have multiple problem solution kind of explorations with objections. Yeah. And then once you get to the one 
that you want to make it real. Mm. How do you do that? So I think it's too easy for a business presentation to stay in a conceptual area, the world of ideas. And in storytelling, we make it real. The character is the way in. The person is the way in. So to go back to kind of my heartland of an advertising agency pitch, if I'm pitching an idea to a marketeer about a great new advertising campaign, how I make it real is I switch it around and I go into the minds of one of their consumers. One consumer. How is that one consumer going to experience this campaign? Not how many millions of dollars are we going to spend or how many thousands of execution is our AI going to create seamlessly? No. One person wakes up in the morning, what's their experience of this campaign? What do they see on their phone? What do they see on uh, the digital posters? What do they see on TV? What do they see on their laptop? How does it interact with them? What happens if they go to the website? What's their experience? And so we make it real by bringing it down to the level of one person. And it just is much more vivid that way. Yeah. And then finally, just to finish the the superb acronym, what, the what is the- What's the B, Mark? It's the best of both worlds. Which means what? Which means, well, I'm borrowing an idea from neuro-linguistic programming here, that there are two kinds of people in the world. And you'd, you'd be entitled to say that's a little bit simplistic, but okay, most people fall into one of these two categories, either towards people or away from people. And towards people, they're all about getting something and away from people, they're all about avoiding something. And they will talk about the same things and they might have exactly the same ideas, but they will see them in totally different ways. So a towards person might say, I'm going to leave the office at 5.30 on the dot because I want to get home in time to share bedtime with my children and tell them stories. An away from person might say, I'm going to leave the office at 5.30 on the dot because if I spend another minute in this office, I am going to go crazy. Okay. Towards person, here's the thing I want to get towards. Away from person, here's the thing I'm trying to avoid. Now, when we tell stories, when we present, when we pitch in business, or we usually assume we're talking to towards people. We tell them how great everything's going to be. And when you only have that towards language, it's exciting, it's innovative, it's new, it's dynamic. No one's ever done it before. It's revolutionary. Towards people are lapping that up. Away from people are thinking, I'm not going to go anywhere near this idea. Every positive moment that you're landing, every positive idea you're landing with a towards person, you're landing a negative with an away from person. So you need some away from language in there as well. You need some risk-free, safety, guaranteed, tried and tested language in there as well. You need to give both of those types of people a sense that we've ended up in a good place. Mark, your framework, the beginning and the end in Superb, the S and the B, and the S you tell us to connect with the audience and find that place of shared agreement experience at the end getting the towards people and the away from people. And when I see those two things added, I can think of a thousand times in my life where I have failed to get to those two people by being positive and optimistic with an overwhelming value proposition at the end, but never really taking into account the away from people. So that was a huge one for me that I'd been missing for 30 years. I would say most people miss it. It's the subtlest point but I think it's so important. So Mark, for people that think they're just bad at storytelling, is there any easy way for them to dip their toe into the storytelling water? Well, obviously if you get the book, but if you read the process and understand the process, and then the homework is the easiest homework in the world, just sit and watch movies and watch TV shows. Once you've got that process in your head and watch it happen in front of you, watch the moment when they save the cat. And when you start watching that great new drama series that, that, that's that got the fantastic hype around it, and after the first episode, you kind of look at each other and go, are we going to carry on watching this? Nah. Ask yourself, did anybody save a cat? Because I bet you they didn't. Because that's the point which you switch out of a series is, I don't care about any of these people. They haven't tried to make me care about any of these people. 
if you want to see it really vividly, go and watch a Marvel movie, you know, because it is absolutely locked in to the structure. So what's one thing that listeners can put into practice tomorrow to make them better storytellers? Wow. I think when you start to write something, instead of thinking, what do I want to say? Ask yourself a different set of questions. Ask yourself, who's the hero? And the answer is the reader or the audience, right? That I've already given you the answer. What's my shared experience with them? And what's the ultimate triumph I'm offering them? Just kickstart the process like that. And instead of thinking, what do I want to say? It's about what do they need to hear to get them to go on the emotional journey I need them to go on and make it all about the audience, not about yourself. Perfect advice. Every one of our listeners can try that tomorrow. So Mark, as we wrap up here, we have a question that we ask all of our guests, and that is, what are you curious about and learning now? Well, so you've already pointed out that the book I wrote before this was about David Bowie and Buddhism. The book I wrote before that was a business book. It was Belonging. It was a book about diversity and inclusion at business. So I'm kind of doing business book, mindfulness Buddhist kind of book, business book. And the, the next book is going back into the mindfulness Buddhism area. And it will be about the meaning of life. So when you ask what I'm curious about, wow, I'm curious about the meaning of life. And I'd like to see any other of your guests top that one. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to top that one. Mark Edwards, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Follow Leading Up, a podcast from Udemy Business, wherever you find your podcast. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode to help you level up your leadership skills. Follow the show so you never miss a new episode. And if you like the show, leave a rating or a review. We love the feedback and it really helps us to find new listeners. To learn more about Leading Up or how Udemy can help you develop leaders at scale and move business forward, visit business.udemy.com. The Leading Up podcast is produced in partnership with Pod People. Our original theme is by Soundboard.